Hello watch enthusiasts and welcome to Watch Chronicler. Amongst watch lovers and enthusiasts, the acronym COMEX has developed a unique attraction. Being the name of France's Compagnie Maritime d'Expertise, this diving firm became the leader in underwater research from the 1970s onwards after the likes of Jacques Cousteau and the US Navy went in different directions in the late 1960s. Most importantly, this company had a very close involvement with watches from Rolex and Omega. It was through COMEX and its endeavours that the Rolex Sea Dweller became the watch it is today, and the Omega Seamaster Ploprof became an icon of the deep. However, the truth behind how this happened is often recounted in dribs and drabs, and as with many things, the truth is rather more complicated than it first seems. Today, and in line with the historical core of Watch Chronicler, I'd like to take you on a subaquatic journey through just how COMEX created legends of these dive watches. As a side note, as I go through this video, I will mention the sources which I can remember in order to allow you to go into more depth than is possible in an even remotely appropriate video length and learn a little bit more. To give you a bit of backstory, COMEX was founded in 1961 and from the late 60s started to lead the field of technical and commercial diving. Specifically, it was COMEX's work which pushed the limits of what an extreme diver could physically withstand with an array of hyperbaric equipment and research ships produced. In fact, COMEX is even known for developing the Saga submarine, which was to be the first commercial nuclear submarine with saturation diving facilities and was co-developed for France and Canada. This ultimately fell through, but I think it illustrates just how serious COMEX were. Where diving missions were concerned, the four most well-known projects were Fisali, Janus, Sagittaire and Hydra. Fisali, 1968-1972, comprised experiments to understand how the human body reacted to pressure. This project revealed the effects of high-pressure nervous syndrome, for example. Janus, 1968-1977, was a project to evaluate the practical uses for commercial divers between 150 and 501 metres. Sagittaire, between 1971 and 74, followed the lines of Fisali and took divers to depths between 300 and 610 metres to see physical and mental changes and how these would affect the divers themselves. And then Hydra, from 68 to 92, tested the use of experimental gases to reach absolute depth records between 70 at the beginning and 1992 Hydra 10 701 metres in an experimental chamber on land. So where do watches come into all of this? Well the first thing to know about Rolex Submariners, Sea Dwellers and Omega Seamasters involved with COMEX is that their history is often misconstrued based on very sensible assumptions. A key assumption is that these brands only offered their watches to COMEX after they'd started standard production. In truth, most watches used, especially in the early years, were prototypes. This story begins with Omega, a brand involved very closely with deep sea exploration since Jacques Cousteau's famous Conshelf missions to test the idea of an undersea long-term habitat for divers to live in. During the Conshelf 3 mission in 1965, at a depth of up to 102.4 metres, the Omega Seamaster 300's worn started to exhibit a serious flaw. They blew off their crystals as they ascended due to a buildup of helium inside the case under pressure. This incident, paired with similar ones elsewhere, was a key moment for Omega, which started to work with up-and-coming COMEX in 1968. At this point, Omega was highly ambitious to use their technical might to create the ultimate dive watch. Of course, the aforementioned Seamaster 300 was hardly a subpar product. Importantly, it used a crystal with an outer lip to be secured in place, although given its failures, this clearly wasn't sufficient. After conducting tests, Omega returned to COMEX with prototype watches, the Ploprof 1 and Ploprof 0. This name was an abbreviation for Plongeur Professionnel, or Professional Diver. Built from Uranus steel, the corrosion-resistant steel used for COMEX's diving bells, and what we would now call 904L steel, these watches were a direct product of the diving firm's engineering. Most importantly, these watches needed to fend off the ingress of helium, something they achieved by being completely airtight in fact a hundred times more airtight than contemporary space capsules. This was managed through large monoblock cases with a screwed crystal. The idea with Ploprof 0 and Ploprof 1 prototypes was to get the diver's perspective on the functionality of these watches, and interestingly the favourite was the Ploprof 0 with its flight master style case and simple rotating bezel as was used in 1968's Hydra 1 experiment. This would ultimately become the later Seamaster 1000, whilst the Ploprof 1, the Seamaster 600, would be more of a favourite with Omega thanks to its push-button system for the bezel. Today we have the successor of the Seamaster 600 in the form of the modern 1200m Ploprof, 
although this doesn't use the innovative design of the original. The original Seamaster 1000 and Seamaster 600 models used a crystal which was supported by a ring around the movement. As pressure increased, it compressed the ring until, without breaking the seal, the hands were stopped by the crystal. This occurred at 1370 meters for the Seamaster 600, but to the best of my knowledge, nobody has put their Seamaster 1000 forward for a crush test, so we don't actually know if it would have fared any better. From what we know, it seems that Comex's divers simply found this varied a cumbersome and largely over-engineered option given the already limited use for bezels during saturation diving. It's worth also noting that the Ploprov Zero, or Seamaster 1000, used by Comex was in prototype form and often appeared with experimental hands and an experimental bezel. These watches reached standard production in the 70s and were used extensively by the Calypso divers of Jacques Cousteau. These watches were tested from 1968 all the way through to the Sagittarius 1 mission in late 71 before, at last, Comex moved away from Omega to Rolex, the brand most often associated with this pioneering firm. Now, before talking about that, we do have to address which watch Rolex was proposing to use. You see, many people assume the 5513 and 5514 200-meter submariners with helium escape valves were the first attempt from Rolex to produce a saturation dive watch. However, the timeline suggests that these were a later addition in the 1970s. In the 60s, it was the Rolex 5512 and 5513 submariners, the 5512 being the chronometer version, which were used by Rolex for missions like, for example, the US Navy's Sea Lab, which began to get seriously close to the 200 meter depth limit. As such, when Rolex began work on the Sea Dweller in 1967, they were merely trying to make a deeper diving watch, as explained by the website Periscope. During Sea Lab 3, however, the prototype single red 500 meter Sea Dwellers worn by divers began to explode on decompression, and soon after, Rolex fitted the iconic valve to relieve internal pressure. The story of how Rolex fitted the gas escape valve is varied, but it now seems fairly conclusive that it was the single red model worn by Dr. Ralph Brower, a really rather remarkable man, by the way, and a pioneer of the understanding of high pressure nervous syndrome whilst working alongside Comex in 68, who first wore this watch. The double red version of the Sea Dweller came in 1969, when Rolex bumped up the water resistance to 610 meters, perhaps in response to Omega's Seamaster 600. These models also had sturdier valves and somewhat thicker cases. Whether this was to package the valve more easily or to increase the water resistance doesn't seem to be known. Importantly, Rolex still hadn't been granted the valve patent filed in 1967, something which only came in 1970. At that point, Rolex could actually market and sell this watch to the general public. The reasons for Comex's change from Omega to Rolex have been discussed at length. Firstly, there was the immense cost of Omega's super divers before considering that the 1000 series movements in both models were relatively unreliable. Additionally, whilst brilliantly engineered, the airtight case trapped moisture after a time change in a diving bell, thus causing dial and movement degradation. The answer, as revealed by historian Jake Ehrlich, was that Rolex needed to get their sea dweller in front of a bigger audience of professional divers. Inevitably, a specialist product like it had little appeal to the average buyer. Consequently, Rolex approached Comex, offering 100 dive watches, as well as appropriate repairs and servicing. This was supplemented, it is reported, with approximately another 100 watches per year from then on. This was hardly enough to turn down, and so the Rolex Sea Dweller became the de facto Comex watch. Nonetheless, our story doesn't end there, because we still have the Comex Submariner to address, a topic which seemingly has less conclusive evidence behind it, and a fair bit less research. The first models, offered until 1973 of the Submariner range, were reference 5513s with a retrofitted helium escape valve. After this, Comex was given its own reference, the 5514, which was a specific model conceived with the valve built in. Whilst early models didn't always show the Comex logo on the dial, they were stamped in various iterations on the case back with Comex Rolex. Interestingly, from 1978, the 5514 was replaced by a valveless reference 1680, the Submariner date. These were branded clearly with the Comex logo and started a chain of such watches which continued to be issued to Comex until 1997. By this stage, Comex's most adventurous work was covered by the Sea Dweller, and in 1992, on the Hydra 10 onshore experiment, the Sea Dweller 16600, the first to feature the calibre 3135, set a depth record of a simulated 701 metres. This was four years after setting the wet depth record of 534 metres off the coast of Marseille, with the previous reference 16660 Sea Dweller, as six divers completed the deepest saturation pipeline work in history. That's quite an achievement, 
and a hell of a testament to how much punishment such watches could take. But here ends this history with two products, very different schools of thought you could say, around saturation dive watches, and ones which continue to inspire new watches today. If you enjoyed this video, take a look at others on similar themes here on Watch Chronicler to learn more about the abyssal world of the dive watch. Please do like, share and subscribe, and let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. Thank you very much for watching, this is Armon from watchchronicler.com, out.